Tonight on Huckabee, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo making biscuits with Marianne Bird. The amazing magic of Puck. Oh, say can you see Harper Grace. That's Trey Corley of the Music City Connection. And I'm your announcer, Keith Bilbrey. We have a fantastic studio audience here tonight, and we're so grateful that you have joined us here on The Huckabee Show. Going to be a lot of fun, great variety tonight. So buckle up and stay with us. Hey, let me ask you a question. What issues do people really care about? Probably the ones that hit them hardest on a personal level, right? I mean, things like gas, groceries, guns, and God. I mean, if they're paying almost twice for the gas to get to work and back, twice what they paid when Joe Biden took office, I'm going to tell you something, that matters. And the groceries that they put on their tables now cost almost 17% more than before, and that matters. Violent crime is rampant across the country, and people are beaten or murdered in the streets or even in their homes, and everybody truly cares about safety. People don't want the government taking legal guns from them that they can have so that they can protect themselves while at the same time, leftist prosecutors let criminals back on the streets before the victims even get out of the hospital. And they don't want to be taken for fools when the government threatens to take children from their parents unless the parents agree to having their own children surgically mutilated or chemically castrated. And folks, families are done with the insanity of believing there are 57 genders and that a child can simply reimagine God-established biology to be whatever the child pretends to be. Yes, there are many other issues that Americans care deeply about. I mean, they watch in horror as public officials open the borders of our nation to allow millions of people who might even be terrorists, criminals, human traffickers, drug dealers, or people with a contagious disease. When people are here illegally and they take over schools, hospitals, and taxpayer-funded hotel rooms so that there's no room for tax-paying citizens, people are rightly outraged. And most Americans... Well, they want us to help neighbors around the world in their fight against tyranny, whether it's in Ukraine or Taiwan. But what they don't want is for there to be billions for a foreign government and then only hundreds of help, hundreds of dollars of pittance of help for Americans like those in Hawaii whose homes and lives were destroyed by the Maui wildfires. And by the way, I think people really do care that John Kerry flies around the world in a private jet all the time lecturing us on using fossil fuel. And you got Al Gore and Barack Obama living in massive beachfront homes that they both claim will soon be swallowed by the ocean because of climate change. Well, if so, why did you get those places, huh? But we're being told to stop using gas stoves, incandescent light bulbs, or gas-driven cars. It's not just that we're being asked to stop using air conditioning and comfort-causing items that we've worked hard to afford and own, but the ones who are dictating to our conduct but they don't practice what they preach. So spare us the double standard in hypocrisy. And do even people left of center, do they really want the government colluding with social media companies so that they can restrict what we can see or hear or restrict us from being able to speak freely without our views being eliminated on Facebook by some 24-year-old working from his laptop in his mom's basement with a bag of Cheetos at his side? I mean, really? I don't think so. What most Americans care about and want, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, or independents, is simply a government that remembers who the boss is. And by the way, the boss is not members of Congress or the bureaucrats that they authorize and fund. It's not the president or his agencies. We don't work for any of them. They work for us. I repeat, they work for us. We are not the servants of government. Government is the servant of the people. 
Citizens have every right to expect that the government will get out of our way so we can live our lives as we see fit, unless it intrudes on the lives and rights of others. Government shouldn't pick winners and losers in the economy by deciding which stores can be open during a pandemic and which ones have to close. We expect and demand that the justice system operate with indifference to someone's political views, their race, ideology, or religion. No person, whether they're male, female, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, rich, or poor, should be treated differently by the criminal justice system. And we've got a right to expect that when we have elections, that every legal voter should get to vote. But no vote should ever be cast by someone not legally entitled to vote. By the way, that means that dead people need to stop voting even in Chicago, okay? <laughs> Gotta stop. Now, I appreciate polls and surveys, and I don't scoff at them. But I also know that we don't have to have a poll to know that Americans want something that's really simple. And that's the right to believe, speak, travel, work, and play. Moms and dads, well, they just make better parents than Uncle Sam. And we don't apologize for the expectation that government will once again work for us rather than against us. <laughs>
uh, will go and see this film, and I think it will be inspiring and informational for them. We have a little clip that we're going to show. This is when you and David Friedman are uh, going and looking at the, uh, uh, the altar of Joshua. Let's take a look. You're staring at an altar of, of Joshua who began, like you, at West Point, right? Right, as and a fighter. As a fighter? As a, someone who graduated from West Point and then had this incredible privilege to serve the United States. It's its most senior diplomat. I, I literally got up every morning reminding myself of the task, uh, the task of, of putting the, our nation in the right place so that we could create peace and prosperity with an understanding of something that's bigger, it's God, right? Joshua came to see that, right? He reconnected the Jewish people with God in this place. It, it's really just so well done. And when I watched it, I, I was, immersed in it. I mean, it wasn't like, okay, I'll watch it because I have to. <laughs> I, I watched it and I, I found myself caught up in it. The time passed so quickly. Uh, interestingly, on the screen, people can see in the lower thirds, there's a QR code. Uh, I, I saw that earlier and I thought maybe I had glaucoma because I couldn't read it, but it's actually a QR code. And if you take your phone and put it up to there on the camera, it will take you to all the theaters locally where you can see the film and a lot of information about it. So while we're having this conversation, people can go up to their television set, hit that QR code with their phone and uh, learn a whole lot about the film. As I was walking this place, I got to travel this road. Um, I was reminded of some of the times I was learning from fifth graders <laughs> in Sunday school <laughs> uh, about these very same stories about how we learn to pray and how we learn to appreciate that these is, this is really the place that Jesus walked. And and so I think everyone will get a chance to see that and learn uh, and an experience in the way that when I got to see it on the big screen for the first time, it was really quite remarkable. One of the things that you were a major architect of was the Abraham Accords. And I don't know if a lot of Americans fully appreciate it because uh, since it was done under the administration of Donald Trump, the media did not give it the attention it deserved. This was a big deal. It was a really big deal. You. David Friedman and others helped to orchestrate getting at the same table Israelis and the UAE, the Emiratis, uh, other governments that are Muslim governments. That must have been a surreal experience to be part of that. You know, Governor, it really was. I, I heard you in your opening monologue talk about government that serves people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we, we, we didn't get it right every day, but we were very focused on that. The Trump administration, we aimed every day we shorthanded it as America first, but yeah. the idea was to deliver good outcomes for the American people. And so we delivered these peace agreements between nations that had been at each other for decades and decades and decades. Uh, and it had great benefits for the countries. It had great benefits for the region. But, you know, I was a soldier and there are a lot of my peers that fought and uh, lost their lives or were injured in wars in the Middle East. And the fact that we were able to create prosperity and peace in that region just reduces risk for a lot of young men and women who are fighting for our country. And so I was just thrilled to be a tiny part of that. And the Abraham Accords, I pray, will be lasting and uh, different from what's gone before, and it'll be really good for America. I want to talk more about the Abraham Accords, the film, and uh, also some things happening this week in the world that you will have some expertise about. We're not letting Secretary Pompeo go just yet, so stick around. Where there's a lot more to come, and we will be right back. Here we go. Well, coming up later, Cash Patel talks deep state in his new book, Government Gangsters. And the magic of Malcolm Puckering is sure to amaze and astound. Don't go away. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on Twitter. And welcome back. We are visiting with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo throughout the Trump administration and an outstanding record that he had. You also were involved in meetings with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. You got some of our hostages back from there. That was one of your wonderful accomplishments. But that must be one of the weirdest places in the <laughs> world to visit. Uh, it, it absolutely is. It was uh, like flying into some place that is unimaginable, empty airport, hotels that are empty. Uh, it was, and, and I was going there too, Governor, at a time when 
Um, you'll remember we'd had an American, Otto Warmbier, yes. who had been held in captivity and had returned home to die from the, his mistreatment there. And I was there just right after that. We still had mm. three Americans there. Uh, and it was the most amazing thing when we got them back. These were Christians. Uh, they, uh, When they got on the plane, one of them wrote me a little note, a psalm, thanking me for what I had done after he'd been through all that suffering. It was it was certainly from a personal perspective, the highlight of my time in the mm. four years uh, to, to get these folks back to their families out of the hands of Chairman Kim, this truly evil, bad guy who's killed thousands of his own people and get these folks back to their own home. It's still something when I think and talk about it's deeply emotional, and I, I stay in touch with a couple of them, uh, and you'll see a little clip from it in the movie, uh, a little clip talking mm. about how it came to be. Uh, a, a lovely time. We didn't pay a nickel to get them back, mm. uh, but we got them home. When I was watching some things happening this week, I was thinking, I wish Mike Pompeo was still Secretary of State. <laughs> we just um, paid Iran, let go of $6 billion to get some hostages back. They, The administration defended it, I don't think that's what you would have done. Well, it's not what we did. We, we, we got folks out of Iran too. President Trump was a, a great boss and he gave me lots of capacity to go work on these problems in the right way. Uh, and the heck of the deal is we're all thrilled to have them back to their families. Anytime we can get Americans home sure. uh, from, from a place like Evan Prison in Iran, it's a great thing. But I think about the next American who will be taken because we now know the price that will be paid by the United States under this administration to get them home. So it is deeply dangerous for every American. And we know this too. We know the Iranians are trying to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. They've said that. And yeah. today they have $6 billion more with which to do that. Now, the, wait, the administration said, oh, but they're gonna use this for humanitarian <laughs> purposes, Secretary. Yes. If, if I gave you $6 billion for something, you could use it for whatever the heck you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and so will, and sadly, so will they. When you were Secretary of State, our country operated with a level of strength. It wasn't that, yeah, we'll acquiesce to your demands. It was, you will negotiate with us because we actually are stronger, bigger, tougher, and we mean it. I'll, I'll give you the, the great example. Pastor Brunson yeah. held in Turkey not to be released. Uh, they were demanding all kinds of concessions from the United States in order to get him back. And we just made very clear, no, you, 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 you will return him. You will do so very quickly or there will be a real price to pay. Uh, first, they didn't do it. We imposed the cost on them. And within a few hours, all of a sudden, uh, it turns out the court system in Turkey was going to let him come home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it turned out to be a great idea. It turned to out to be go. a great idea. And it's the, it's the right way for America to exercise what is our duty to get these folks back and to get Pastor, Pastor Brunson back home. It's just really special. He knew that he was going to be there for the rest of his life. He would die in a Turkish prison except America acted like America, that's and right. they showed their strength. That's exactly right. And I think, to the best of my knowledge, that's now six years on, I yeah. think. I don't believe the Turks have taken another American hostage. This, this is the pattern. We can do it when America leads, when you have a strong president and strong leadership in, the, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I pray that we get it back before too long. How hard was it to transition between soldier Mike Pompeo, the West Point graduate, and then diplomat? Mike Pompeo. <laughs> my wife would tell you diplomat <laughs> wasn't something anybody thought I'd ever have to have after my name. Uh, for me, it, it was just about trying to lead to be a servant leader. Um, President Trump got elected. My mission set was to deliver on behalf of what President Trump asked me to do for the American people. And boy, we, we worked our tail off every day to try and get those outcomes for the American people. We were we were unembarrassed. We never apologized. President Trump's like, no, go there and tell them we're sorry. Like, no, go, go there and tell them. If we, if, like, if we mess up, fair enough. But we never apologized for America because we know the American people are decent and good mm -hmm. and wonderful. And this is a country like none other in the world. How refreshing for that policy to be in place. And I think every American appreciates that. I really hope people will see the film. Uh, Route 60, it's, it's a masterful piece. No, you've got to be proud of that, to be part of that uh, process. I, I am proud. I was a little piece. Ambassador Friedman's idea. TBN did great production. Uh, you know, we, we did this while the uh, actor strike was on, in spite of what those folks do in Hollywood. <laughs> we decided we'd still go make ourselves a, a really fine movie. And I hope folks will, this coming week, go, go see it. Take their, their Bible study, their church group. Uh, it's for people of all ages. Kids could go see it and learn from it as well. And I hope Bible studies will pick it up. It's a wonderful opportunity to learn about Israel and the Bible and the greatness of the American nation. I think I speak for a whole lot of Americans when I say I hope that your public service is not 
yet completed, that we will see Mike Pompeo on the national stage many times again. It would be to the benefit of America for that to happen. Thank you very much. Very, very much. Now, you're going to want to check out the film Route 60, The Biblical Highway. It's only in theaters this coming week, September the 18th and the 19th, to buy tickets and to follow Secretary Pompeo. If you go to Huckabee.tv, we'll connect you to both the film and to the secretary. Right now, Keith Bilbury is standing by. He's got nothing else to do other than tell us what we have coming up in this theater right here tonight. Keith? Oh, but it's a tough job. Coming up, Mary Ann Bird rises to the occasion and puts on a biscuit-making clinic. And later, Harper Grace triumphs with a redemption song, Oh Say Can You See. Watch out, Huckabee is on a roll. This is going to be fun. And here's why. Marianne Bird is a journalist. She found a second career after she made the Emmy-winning PBS documentary, The Rise of the Southern Biscuit. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that, right? And there is nothing that is more authentically Southern than a good biscuit. She is now the founder of the Southern Bell Biscuit Company, right cheer in Nashville. She has taught thousands of people how to make perfect Southern biscuits. And now she's taking on the ultimate challenge, teaching me how to make Southern biscuits. Please welcome Marianne Bird. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hello. All right. Are you ready? I am so ready. Okay. I love me some Southern biscuits. In, in my class, I teach this in two and a half hours, so we're going to do this in six minutes. So here, let's do it. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. I, I'm going to teach you my biscuit blueprint. It's on the back of my bag of flour. It's okay. three things. Okay. I'm going to do my quickest one, and that's an oil biscuit. So I have my own flour. We're going to do two cups of self-rising biscuit flour. This is soft red winter wheat. It has a low gluten content of 7.5% to 9.5%. So you want a low gluten uh, flour for your biscuits. If you have the wrong flour, they're going to be heavy, okay? Boom, 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 but boom. But you mix your own flour and sell it because the commercial flour does not make the best southern biscuit, does it? I don't think so. There you That's go. That's why I got my own made. This is grown by Southern farmers in Kentucky and it's blended for me in Kentucky. I kind of like best. that. It's I so like good. it because it's real. So good. So uh, Phyllis at the Wilson County Fair taught me this one. Uh -huh. You just throw oil in. This is the quickest one since we only have six minutes. Okay? I don't use a recipe. You didn't even measure that. Well, no real biscuit maker does. Oh, okay. Okay? You guys, right. I hold it like a baby on my hip and I use my spatula and I scrape and I scooch. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I break, in, I break the uh, fat up into there. And then I get my hands into it. You want to try? Sure. You pick up handfuls of flour. I'm throw I, some I, I of call it, it counting. I call it counting your money. Count your money. Ah. Okay. You you want that fat all the way through the flour? Go ahead and do it. Okay. Count your money. Mmm. You want yummy? Lots of money. Yum money, money, money. Here we go. Yummy fat in yummy every bite of biscuit. When you don't mix your fat in really well, you have dry pockets of. Uh, hmm. Biscuit, you can't have that. No, okay? we don't want that. This is the secret. This is what makes it good. Really? That's okay, I like that. You think I'm doing well? Yep, you do. Good. And then what I do is I just, I'll do my reigning move where I make sure it's in all of it, okay? okay. Make sure it's mixed all the way, no dry pockets of flour. Then we're going to add in, I have a low-fat buttermilk today. Oh, okay? I love buttermilk and everything. And we do. Okay, like that. Mm. And then I hold it like this, and I scrape and scooch. That baby's back in your arms. You scrape and scooch. Scrape yeah. the walls of the scooch. You didn't measure that buttermilk either. Well, no, it's no fun when okay. you measure. Um, but if you are a measuring person, I'll teach you in my class how you can get a... Okay. But I think it's more fun to do it like this, and all the biscuit makers in my documentary and book do it like that. You want to try to stir it like that? Sure. I'm not going to lean it against my jacket, because that well, might look, look bad for the rest of it. this is what happens. Yeah. You no. wore black tonight, too. You know, Mariana, I'm It's very self-destructive, but I flower. do it. Um, you're kind of, I call this my baby. You're kind of beating your baby. Oh, okay? I'm so sorry. Um, you guys, when, like you, when you're heavy, when you, when you mash potato that or whip it, it yeah, gets it ups be, the gluten. Should I be gentle? So my flour is 8% gluten. He's just made it into 12. Stop. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. You do it. 
There we go. All right, here we go. Fails. That's our baby. Let's get them out real okay. quick. Okay, there's our baby. Sprinkle your baby. Sprinkle the baby. Little uh, Johnson okay. and Johnson powder yeah. on the baby. And now we're gonna hold. Do not put Johnson and Johnson powder on your biscuits, however. Okay, I want you to hold, fold, and turn. You're writing grandma a letter. Hold the piece of paper. You fold it over. You turn it towards your heart. Hi, mm. grandma. Fold the paper. Go. Okay, you got it. Real stories in okay. this, right? Well, you Hi, don't. Hi, grandma. You guys don't want it. Don't. Oh, did I mess that up? That's right. And then turn it towards your heart. Oh, okay. Hi, grandma. Hi, grandma. Here's another one. <laughs> hey, I wish well, I could you, you make gotta, it. You got to pull your hand oh. out, hon. Put them out like that. Okay. There you go. Turn it around to the heart. There we go. Hi, grandma. There you go. Hey, Grandma. You've got to keep your hand out of there, okay? Oh. Right, get it out. All right. Okay. He's got to take my class. He needs more time. I plan to do it. I really okay. do. I'm going to do that. You need some work, but that's all right. I have biscuit detention for people <laughs> like you, okay? You probably you throw biscuits at people in your class, don't you? No, I don't do that. No. Everyone leaves a biscuit star when they take my class. Oh, okay. They all. Everyone looks like they've been baking for two years when they Wonderful. Leave. You guys want to roll it real quick. Okay. Don't steamroll baby's face. Okay, lightly go, okay, lightly, lightly. lightly. And I'm, I'm doing this real fast for TV. Normally it's really pretty. And then um, I get my cutters, okay? I'm gonna have you cut this. Okay. And you can choose which one you want. This is the dating around cutter, no commitment. No. This is the commitment biscuit, that's your cat head, okay? And then up, down, don't twist, okay? Okay. And then we get our pan. I always use a, always butter my pan. You want butter on the bottom Absolutely. of your biscuit. Okay, there's our baby there. Put Go that ahead. butter on there. Let's get, now, don't twist your cutter, okay? Okay. Pick what size oh, you like. Oh, use this one. I like this big oh, butter. Okay. Up, there down, we. don't twist. Twist? No, no, no. Oh, don't twist. Now... See, when you twist the edges, oh yeah, when they're in the oven, they struggle to go up. Ah. Okay, when you go straight up and down, it rises. All right, let's right pretend we did all that. Now we get them in the oven, and then we're going to get to the finished deal here. You, you have to brush your babies butter. with butter. Oh, yeah. And then you get your sugar, and you hit it. Oh, sugar. It's a secret, but now everyone knows it. Ah. But that's a secret. Sugar. OK, you put them in the oven at 450 for 18 minutes, turn mm -hmm. the pan at 9, and out they come. OK, voila. Ooh. OK. Real biscuits. Real. Southern biscuits. You guys. So that's that's what we were looking for right there, right? You butter your babies, okay? Butter the babies and give them to someone you love. Oh, uh, thank you, Mary Now, of course, Ann. this pan would normally be scalding hot. Uh, so I made hot jam gravy, okay? So we're going to. That's great. Let's get you a biscuit real quick. Okay. Okay. Let's get a biscuit. While you're doing that, I'm going to tell everybody that you need to check out Mary Ann's book. It's called The Biscuit Dive Guide. And when you're in Nashville, you can sign up for her biscuit class. I promise I'm going to sign up and take her class. All that information on how to do that is at Huckabee.tv. She has made me one beautiful looking biscuit with all these fancy preserves on it. So while I eat biscuits, Keith's going to butter you up by telling you what's coming next. Here we go. Keywords bring he's going to eat the biscuit. Well, after the break, former senior government official Cash Patel gives us a glimpse into the deep state. Later, the magic of Fox. Stick around, you're watching Huckabee. They had a real hard time getting me off that table of the biscuits, I'm just telling you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what you don't have a hard time getting me to talk about, and that's the volunteers at Samaritan's Purse. And here's why. They continue to work around the clock to help those in need all over the nation and, quite frankly, all over the world. Every bit of this couldn't happen without your prayerful and financial support. Because when you give to Samaritan's Purse, you not only help to provide physical aid for suffering people, but many hearts and lives are changed forever in Jesus' name. I hope you'll give today to Samaritan's Purse by going to their website or calling them and doing it today. Thanks and God bless. Well, Cash Patel has served in many high-level roles in the federal government, including senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, senior director for counterterrorism at the National Security Council, and as chief of staff to the acting Secretary of Defense during the Trump administration. He's got a brand new book. I love the title, Government Gangsters. Yeah, he says he expects some backlash for it, no doubt. But the American people deserve to have a look behind the curtain 
to help us see what's back there. Welcome back to the show, Cash Patel. Cash, welcome back. Good Thank to have you. I, I find it interesting. Your book should have been out months ago, but it got delayed because the federal government wanted to take a good look at it. Could you believe that they wanted to do some censorship? You know, I thought when I wrote this book after 16 years in government, I wanted a roadmap for people who wanted to educate and be inspired, but also serve our country. The most important thing I wanted to put out was the truth. And we took about three months to write the book, but um, we'd spent 10 months fighting the Biden administration's blockade. I had to sue them in federal court to win the rights back to my manuscript to release it. So the question is, what do they not want you to see in this book? Why would they hold it so long? I mean, either if they said that it was not true, they would have just said, well, it, it's a bunch of lies. So go read it and we'll tell you it's all lies. That's not what they did. They tried to keep it out of the hands of the public. They would have done that or they would have redacted 98% of the book. And if you actually look at it, um, you have one of the first pre-sale copies, Governor. I'm, I'm glad to be on your show, and thank you for having me. They redacted less than 0.05% of the book, so you have to ask yourself what's in there. So what's in Government Gangsters is it's not a Republican or Democrat thing. When you go serve the United States of America, you go serve our country. You don't serve a political party, and you serve the mission. And I serve the national security mission, and I named people who failed. I named Republicans. I named Democrats. I named why they failed. But most importantly, I tell the people how we fix our agencies and departments so they're no longer weaponized for political purposes. That's what I think many of us are worried about, Cash. There is a weaponization of the alphabet agencies, mm -hmm. whether it's the DOJ, the FBI, yeah. the CIA, whatever it may be. And, and they're being used to attack political opponents, which, I, mean, I don't care what a person's political persuasion mm -hmm. is, that's unacceptable. How it's, do we fix that? It's, un, it's unacceptable. It's unconstitutional, uh, Governor. Yeah. And the way we fix it, what I talk about in Government Gangsters, is you have to use not just the executive branch for personnel and not just the cabinet secretaries, but go 10 levels down. Then you got to give Congress its constitutional oversight authority and empower them to come in when people fail, when people break the law. Yeah, well, one thing I'm very concerned about, you mentioned it, Cash, is that if Congress is not allowed to do the function, that it is its constitutional duty, and that's oversight. Yeah. So that they look at things. They are our elected representatives. They are supposed to examine whether or not government work is being done properly, correctly, constitutionally. They get stonewalled all the time, and the agencies say, no, we are not going to give that information. Aren't they required by law? to cough up the information that Congress has for? These agencies work for the United States Congress. You're right, it's a constitutional repu uh, republic re requirement that they go and report to them, not just how they're spending money, but how they're conducting business. But the problem is the heads of these agencies have, as you said, have stonewall Congress. So there's a, there's a solution for this. And I, we did it once when I ran the Russiagate investigation. It's our taxpayer dollars that fund these alphabet agencies. And Congress writes the checks. So when they break the law, when they fail to produce documents, you take some of their money. Describe and tell us what is the deep state and how should we be afraid of it? I wish it was a fiction, Governor. I wish we didn't have a deep state. And the deep state has become so large that it's no longer deep and quiet. It's just out in the open. And, it, and it's weaponized by not just the folks in government, but the mainstream media. They have just lampooned themselves and attached themselves onto whatever political narrative they want to advance. I mean, whether or not you like Donald Trump or dislike him, half the country still thinks he's a Russian asset. And look at the Hunter Biden fiasco. Five yeah. years ago, this individual should have been charged with a simple felon in possession gun charge. It took five years, a special counsel and multiple congressional investigations to charge him with what any other individual would have been charged with overnight. This two-tier system of justice is emblematic of the deep state. And in order to crush it, you have to go after not just the media, but the individuals responsible. And you gotta get the judiciary involved. There's too many judges mm. who are going and rubber stamping these actions. And I encourage Congress to start impeaching some of these lifetime appointments. I think it's uh, a, a book whose time has come. Government Gangsters is the name of it. It's out right now. I hope you'll go to Huckabee.tv, follow the links to get your copy of Government Gangsters. You can also follow Cash Patel on social media. Keith Bilbrey, uh, he's not a gangster, he's a good guy. And he's gonna tell us what's coming up next. Keith? Well, the magic of Puck is here to dazzle our audience next. Then get ready for an incredible performance by singer Harper Grace. It's all ahead on Huckabee.
Huckabee.tv and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. Welcome back, everybody. We just came back into the fantastic music of Trey Corley and the Music City Connection, doing a little Rick Derringer's Rock and Roll Hoochie Coo. I bet all of you knew that song. But you didn't hear it in church. I know you did not. But it is a great song. And we have the best band in America, Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. Give them a hand. Well, speaking of great performers, our next performer has done something very special. He turned a troubled upbringing in the foster care system into a lifelong successful career in magic. He's performed all over the world. And finally, he has reached the pinnacle of show business, my show. He's here. <laughs> Prepare to be astounded by the magic of Puck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, folks, uh... I started doing magic when I was really young, and I always uh, relied on my element of surprise to catch people off guard with my magic. But tonight, I thought I'd do something a little different. I actually give you guys, tell you guys what I'm going to do before I do it. See, this way, you guys are going to be expected before it happens. Uh, tonight, I like to perform the illusion of the torn and restored newspaper. Now, when it's illusion, I'm going to apparently tear this newspaper into shreds. And with a little bit of magic, I'm going to recombine the pieces back to the very same paper again. I'm going to paste through. Those of you down there in front, if you could, get a look at the ad, a headline, a caption, or a picture. Something so should you see this paper again, you'll be able to recognize it. <laughs> it's actually kind of funny every time I do this trick. It kind of reminds me of my, uh, my daughter. She's a teenager now, and I find that teenagers are a lot like newspapers because every day, a new issue. Yeah. <laughs> now for the illusion. Are you watching this? Remember, <laughs> none of this is really happening. Watch. <laughs> see that? See that? Didn't happen. Didn't happen. See, that's an illusion. It's an illusion. You have to listen. Listen real close. Listen. It even sounds like I'm tearing that paper. Huh? Doesn't that sound real? This is the artist participation part. <laughs> Doesn't that sound real? <laughs> Conservatives. <laughs> now for the hard part. <laughs> On the finger, that is. <laughs> now, people actually come to me after the show and says, Puck, you know what? That looks so realistic, so convincing, I actually imagined I saw separate pieces in each hand. But like I said, none of this is real. None of this is happening. <clears throat> it's all in your mind, all an illusion. It's kind of like fake news. <laughs> <laughs> now for the recombining process, squeezing these pieces back. <laughs> now, in the count of three, I'm going to toss these pieces to the air. The moment they hit about, about right here, each and every piece is going to visibly fuse back together. <laughs> Man, I like to see this one myself. <laughs> but this happens on the count of three. One, two, and three. And there's the paper back together again. I see most of you don't believe me, so here, take a look. I do hope you remember something from the paper. That's the illusion. I thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I started doing magic when I was really young, and uh, I lived, grew up in New York, and my dad took me to see a magician, and uh, the magician that day, his name was Earl Presto Johnson, a phenomenal magician, and I thought tonight I'd do one of Presto's tricks in tribute to him. Uh, to do this, though, I'd like to get a little help. Governor, would you mind helping me out? Be a little fun? As long as you don't tear me up, well, I'll, I'll for the governor. I'll over. <laughs> You know, I'm sitting here watching you do that, and we all are back here, and every one of us are looking at you and looking at each other saying, how in the world did he do that? It's I no have fun no to idea. know, trust me. Okay. <laughs> all right, Governor, you really going to hold on to this boss me in both hands okay. for me? All right. All right. Now, uh, when I do magic, I don't like having people to the sides of me, and I definitely don't have like people have behind me because they can see how the tricks are done. But today, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to give you guys, the audience, a backstage view. You guys are going to get to see how the trick works. You, though, Governor, hopefully will not be able to see how it works. For you, it'll be invisible, but mm -hmm. you guys will get to see it. Okay. But when you see it, do me a favor. Don't let on that you see it. Don't look like this. Don't point. Don't shout out. Laugh, though. Have a good time. Don't let on to him. We'll see how many times we can do it until the Governor figures it out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you, you will, uh, you will eventually figure it out. Okay, eventually. you will. Okay, yeah. you will. You might even catch me first time. You don't even know. All right, this is really easy. All I have to do is watch my hands. Let me know okay. when you see it or you don't see it. Right? SpongeBob goes inside the hand. Right? I, I, I wiggle the fingers, blow in the hand. Did you see it go? No. See, it's not here or here. But watch. I roll it down. It's over there. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see, they okay. can see it, but you couldn't see it. So now, now how it works? We'll try it one more time. Watch. Okay. SpongeBob goes inside the hand. Okay. I slap the hand like this. Did you yep. see it go? No. See, it didn't go anywhere yet. <laughs> yeah, I didn't turn the hand over. <laughs> one more time, it goes inside the hand. I slap the hand. Okay. Slap it again. Wiggle the fingers. Blow the hand. Did you see it go? 
That's crazy, huh? Yeah, I didn't see where it went. It's I did really not see it. <laughs> that was so cool, you know? We're You're gonna, laughing <laughs> at me. We're gonna try it again. We're gonna try it again. We'll try it again. We'll try it again. Okay. All right, one more time. This one goes inside the hand. I mean, I'm pretty Where's close looking? to this. I should be able to watch. figure it out. Did you see it? Yo. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, not here, here, but watch. It's over here. See, I think you're catching on. Yeah, I can see it. I can see it in your eyes. One more time, real slow. Goes inside the hand. Slap the head. Slap it again. Look at the face. Grow the head. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> this is. All right, we're going to try We're going to try some We're going to try some us. Hold okay. both hands out like this, okay? okay? Put one in each hand. All right. And we're going to name these balls. I don't know where they went. No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna name these. This is gonna be Romeo. This is gonna be Juliet. Okay. Right. Watch, Romeo goes inside the hand. This is Juliet. Take Juliet, put it in your hand, tight fist, okay. hold there your hand go. above your head. Okay. When I say so, I want you to say, Come here, Romeo. Come here, Romeo. Did you see Romeo go? No, I did not. Did but you happen to feel Romeo creeping in your hand? Join I Juliet? I didn't see Romeo go anywhere. Keep your hand closed. Okay. Bring it down. Okay. Open it up slowly. Oh. He's got Romeo and Juliet. Yes. How'd he get in there? <laughs> Good job. Sneaky little fella. That's crazy. All right, this time it's going to be a little harder for me, that is. I'm going to okay. try to do it with two balls. It's really right. hard with two. Two go inside the hand. Slap the hand. Slap it again. Yeah. <laughs> slap your hand. Watch. I'm going to slap your face in a minute. I think this is just good. <laughs> All right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to okay. let you in on the gag. Okay. I'm going to let you in on the All gag. Right. I take the sponge off, put it inside the hand like this. I don't really put it in the hand. I hide it over here. Uh -huh. so you can see that. That's why they're laughing. Oh, okay. okay. Then I say it's here. I hide it behind the hand. Hide it behind the back of the hand to the front and just roll it down. See, now you know how it Yo, works. where's that other I'll one? show you one more time. Watch. Go inside the hand. Slap the hand. Slap it again. Blow in the hand. Where's the sponge ball? No! <laughs> Where did you put it? Do my favor. Governor, I think this tricks a little bit over your head. I think it is. Stand up for me. Okay. Put mine. Take a look behind you. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Puck's autobiography is titled... Finding Magic, Memoirs of a Magician. And he's got a special show for at-risk youth. I hope you will go to Huckabee.tv. Hey, book him for your event. You see how much fun we're having? You could have that same bunch of fun in your community by booking Puck to come to your town. Right now, Keith, who is not magical at all, he <laughs> might be willing to tell us something that is magical that is about to appear. Oh, he picked the right assistant tonight. Harper Grace is here with a very important message and a beautiful song performance right after the break. So don't you go away. as we welcome Kansas Senator Roger Marshall to the studio. Also, the glorious gospel music from Point of Grace. Welcome back. Now, when tonight's musical guest was just 11 years old, she sang the national anthem at an event with no monitors. Her off-key performance was viciously attacked online. She even got death threats at age 11. But boy, did she ever show them. She's now an American Idol top 50 veteran and a rising country star. She sings the national anthem now all over the country, and she's sharing her anti-bullying message on her redemption tour. It is an honor to welcome to the show, Harper Grace. <laughs> it's good to have you here, Harper. Thank you for having me. You know, when I heard this story, you were 11 years old, and you go into this soccer stadium, you're asked to do the national anthem, and they really sucker punched you because they didn't tell you that their loudspeakers were going to be feeding back and echoing in your ears. You can't get pitch <laughs> to sing when that's going on, but they blasted you for it. You know, most 11-year-olds would have folded and never again gone on a stage. Did you think about that? Just oh saying, that's gosh. it? Quit? Yeah, I mean, we had death threats sent into our personal mailboxes at home with, you know, knives and fake blood on them. Um, I definitely had times where I thought that I wanted to curl up in a ball and never sing again, but faith was what got me through all of it. I knew that the Lord had a plan. My parents changed their prayer that day and asked the Lord to use me in a mighty way. And so I just had faith in knowing that 
God was going to make something beautiful out of the crazy storm. My heart now is to really just be an inspiration to anybody, you know, who's experienced the bullying in general, because it's just, it's a hard place to get torn down, especially for something that you love to do. But hoping that the story that the Lord's placed there for me to be able to use as a testimony is an encouragement to let anybody know whatever is placed in your heart that you can do anything you set your mind to. And one of the songs that you are now performing is called Oh, say, can you see? It's kind of yes. the story of what happened. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, that has to be sort of the last laugh on your part. I, I'm super honored to have a song that talks about the experience, but also how I got through it. It's kind of set up as a, a, a letter to my younger self. Hmm. And um, it's kind of this redemption song that has tells the story of exactly what happened. Every single thing in the song is true, but it doesn't go to the deepest, darkest part. But, you know, it's it's coming out of that and realizing that it's 11 years later, you know, yeah. and I get this, this song that I'm singing to my younger self at the same time that I'm also going out and singing the national anthem and, and redeeming myself all over again because we have such a great redeemer and open opportunities that are presenting itself for me to do so. And I also get to go into different um, cities and schools and share you know, the anti-bullying story that is being presented and it's been great. You're at an age where a lot of people are afraid mm -hmm. to speak out about biblical truth. I can't tell you how refreshing it is to see someone young and <laughs> biblical and grateful to God for what you're doing. Wow, it's thanks. very powerful, very powerful. Well, I, I continue to pray for boldness and courage to do so. <laughs> I think you're getting it. Thanks. And while uh, Harper gets ready to play and to sing, Keith is gonna tell our viewers how they can hear more of Harper's music, which I think they're gonna wanna do. Well, head to Huckabee.tv and we'll connect you to her latest releases, tour information, social media pages, and more. Now, performing Oh Say Can You See with Trey Corley and the Music City Connection, here's Harper Grace. You're just 11 and it ain't fair. They laugh about your clothes and your dreams going nowhere. Those cop bell mean girls like to talk Used to sit with the cool kids But now they're calling you stupid Why you eating all alone in a bathroom stall Oh darling, right now it's hard to understand This moment right here is gonna write your Sometimes walking through the dark is the only way out. Hey, young girl, me, you'll get back off your knees and up on a stage one day singing to the crowd. Oh, say, can you see?
me now? Can you see me now? 